Welcome to Authored by Us, a podcast celebrating children's books about characters of color or of different cultural experiences and the authors who bring these diverse works to life. Each week, we invite you to join us as we turn the pages of these bookshelf gems and hear from their creators who understand that stories of diverse experience truly come to life when authored by us. Here's your host, Zenzi Hodge. Greetings and welcome back, listeners. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Authored by Us. Today's episode will air on May 19th, Malcolm X's birthday. I remember when I first read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I was in high school, and there is one memory he shares that still gives me chills to this day. This is the passage during which he recounts his high school counselor telling him to find a more realistic career goal because being a lawyer was not something that he can be. A career in carpentry was suggested instead. He went on to recount that he realized that whatever he wasn't, he was smarter than nearly all of the Caucasian students, but lamented that apparently he was not intelligent enough in their eyes to become what he wanted to be. It still makes me angry because there's a child out there with the dream of becoming whatever it is that they dream. And unfortunately, if they cannot see who they can become, or if someone decides to squash that dream by telling them that it is unrealistic, then we may lose a potential lawyer, author, teacher, or doctor. Well, this week's author believes that life is about demonstrating possibility. And with her book, You Can Become a Doctor Too, she is giving to young readers that gift of possibility. Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal is the owner of Paradigm Dental Center, LLC. She graduated magna cum laude from the University of Memphis, earned a Doctor of Dental Surgery, DDS, from the University of Tennessee's College of Dentistry, and a Master's in Public Health from Harvard University. She's also the founder of globally recognized nonprofit, the 516 Foundation, with its primary initiative, Determined to be a Doctor Someday, DDS, created to encourage underrepresented students to pursue careers in healthcare. Her book, You Can Become a Doctor Too, is her first children's book, and she enjoys her family, which consists of her husband, Arthur, their three boys, Arthur III, Artemis Yancey, and artisan Christoph, and a rescue puppy named Azalea. Welcome to the show, Christina, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Zinzi. I am so excited to talk to you about this book. When I saw it, it, it really made me think about the fact that I too could become a doctor. And it's so important for children to see who they can become. And also now to have that in a book that they can read uh, and, and engage with different professions in the medical field, it really gives them some clear insight. So without me giving away too much, why don't you tell us about your book, You Can Become a Doctor Too? Absolutely. As you mentioned, this is my first publication. And I wanted it to have special meaning. My husband and I have three sons, as you mentioned in my bio. So it's very important to me that the main character be an African-American male. In the setting of the book, it occurs at a school called Gordon Elementary. And for Memphians, those who reside in Memphis, Tennessee, they know that Gordon Elementary is a school situated in the inner city, which is where I grew up. Throughout the book, the characters ask questions such as, am I the right skin color? I don't have money. My parents aren't here. These are questions I had as a child. And so I made the characters ask these questions of the mentor in the book because I wanted them to be affirmed. And I wanted them to know that regardless of your situation that you did not cause and that you may have been born into, becoming a doctor is still a possibility for you. Many of the characters, the doctors, are also people in my life who've been influential in some way. So the doctors that you see in the book have been assigned names because they are real people who've been instrumental in my journey. That, that is a tremendous honor to um, be a featured character in someone's book. Uh, so first, I want to I go back to you mentioned that the book is set in Memphis. And so you were intentional about making it your community. This was not a fictional environment. This was your actual community. 
why was it so important for you to give this tribute to Memphis? And is this something that you're hoping that will have an impact specifically to that Memphis community? Because that's where you are also from. I love Memphis. And like most inner cities, we have perils. We have things that we are working through, but there's always so much potential. The culture, the music, the history, the people, we are all amazing. Sometimes when you're living in a situation, you don't see that amazement that everyone else sees. <laughs> and regardless if you live in Memphis or Houston or Jackson, Mississippi or Brooklyn, New York, we all have similar backgrounds, similar issues that we face. But definitely placing Memphis in the book, especially because we get so much negative press, was very critical to me. And I love that the students in the class, they first of all, they all look different. So it was not just black children in the class. You had children that were that were Caucasian, uh, that were Asian. So you had a very vastly diverse classroom population, but also the experiences that they presented to Dr. Reed, those were various experiences as well. You had one student stating, do I not, don't I need a lot of money to become a doctor? Or I've lost my parents. I, I'm not alone, but how do I move forward from that experience? Or I, I, I live in a situation where there's a lot of crime. And so you presented not just different people, but different socioeconomic conditions. And you allowed them to, to talk through, even with all of this. So as I said in the introduction, even with all that Malcolm X said that he wasn't. You showed them who they could still be through all of that. Yes. And diversity was important to me. Um, although I did want the main character highlighted because I feel like African-American males do not tend to be shown in the most positive light in anything, in press, in media, on the news, <laughs> in shows. And so that was very critical. But it was also important that all of the characters be diverse from diverse backgrounds because we all live a human experience. And regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your race, you still have things you have to overcome too. And it was important for me that all children saw what they were capable of becoming. I, I like that, that they can all see who they're capable of, capable of becoming. You know, you mentioned the one student by the name of Art. And so I read your book first, and then I read your bio after. and so. I realized why he has that particular name, but can you tell us, was Art inspired by anyone in your life? Oh, <laughs> Art was definitely inspired by my children, my sons, um, <laughs> Arthur III, Artemis, and Artisan. They all have the prefix A-R-T in their names. <laughs> so they have to share a character. Oh, wow. Siblings yeah. don't particularly like to share things, but now they're sharing a character. So, so that's good. It's not one. It's, it's all three together. And what's ironic, when I did the voiceover for the book, the youngest, my youngest son is the actual voiceover. So he really identifies wow. with the character. However, the character looks exactly like my middle son. So I think there's <laughs> aspects of each of them. And my oldest son is studying to become a veterinarian. So <laughs> aspects wow. of each of them, are, you know, is in the character. So, Christina, you are a dentist by trade, but now you have entered into being an author. How, how did this happen? And you could have written about anything. You could have written a book about teaching children how to properly care for their teeth, right? Yes. But you decided to take this route. How did you get, how did you get here? So, Zinzi, it was really a seamless transition because in addition to being a dentist, I'm also a nonprofit founder. And the primary initiative of my nonprofit is called Determined to Be a Doctor Someday, where I take students who are 14 to 18 years of age and expose them to various healthcare disciplines. Uh, Pre-COVID, we met on the campus of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. We had monthly sessions. Doctors came in, told their stories, talked about their journeys. We gave scholarships, gave prizes. Um, and then we also incorporated um, a program for a younger audience, two to five years of age, and we call it our DDS Explorers program. And these babies were come, would come in and they'd be so excited. And I found myself reading other authors' books to them. And I'm thinking, why not tell my story to these babies? 
And so that was how You Can Become a Doctor Too came to be because I wanted to share my story and reach a larger audience without having to be physically present. I love that dentists have books in their in their offices. You know, my son's dentist, she does that as well. And it's usually not a place where children feel comfortable. You know, you, you go to the dentist, you're thinking, well, something's something unfortunate may be happening to my teeth. But it's also such a very friendly place. I love that they have books. It's something that allows them to allows the children to be distracted, to be entertained while a dentist is working on on their teeth. So I, I really enjoy that. But you mentioned your your DDS program mm-hmm. for younger children. And I think there is so much value in that because when a young child goes to the dentist, if they're thinking about discomfort with that experience, they may not consider the possibilities of a career mm-hmm. coming out of that. Yes. So, and the cool thing yeah. about the program, it's not just focused on dentistry. So because it's held at the University of Tennessee, they come in, we talk about medicine, we talk about dentistry, we talk about veterinary medicine, and they get to do actual hands-on activities related to each of those professions. So it's really a great chance to expose them to so much that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. And it's beyond the traditional school curriculum. Not everything that we need to experience is learned within the walls of the classroom. So true. So true. (laughs) We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. Authored by Us is made possible by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So we're back with Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal. So Christina, while we were on break, you and I talked a little bit about the the fact that your foundation has been around for 10 years. So You started with a younger group of children 10 years later. They are taking their careers to a new to a new level or to the level that you would hope that they would be. So tell us about the successes of the 516 Foundation. Yes. So we started the foundation 10 years ago in the Determined to be a Doctor Someday program. And in that very first cohort of students, we're starting to finally see the fruits of our labor. One student is set to graduate from dental school at Howard University next week. So super, super excited about that. Um, Our very first scholarship recipient is pursuing an MD, PhD at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. So the very campus this organization was started on, she's now enrolled and doing a dual degree program. And then another student is in medical school at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. And another student is, is in pharmacy school. So we are really starting to glean, you know, from the the harvest and and we're excited about it. Wow. That is amazing. That's so amazing. Now with your foundation, you have, you've proven the value of giving back and mentorship. And I heard you mention that earlier uh, with your book that you have characters that are based on actual people in your community who served as mentors to you. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then I also want to talk with you more deeply about the character, Dr. Reed, and the role that she played, because she didn't just educate the students on professions. She really gave them affirmations and helped to foster their belief in their possibilities. So tell us about those. Yes. So all the characters have special meaning, as I mentioned. And I won't give you the complete rundown or list of each of them and how they've contributed to my life. But I will say, for example, um, one of my junior high school classmates, Greg Shaw, is a veterinarian. And anytime I would call him and ask him for assistance with my nonprofit, even if he couldn't make it, he would be a listening ear. And so I was sure to include him because I'm also very proud of him. Another um, listed character is Dr. Ray Giss, and he was the first African-American a president of the American Dental Association, but he's also my mentor. And from our very first encounter, anything I've ever asked of him, he's always made it happen. And I'm just so grateful because a man of his prestige and his position could have easily said, you know, I don't have the time. My dental school mentor, Dr. Walitha Watson, she's always told me to enjoy the journey. She's written letters of recommendation for everything I've ever applied to. So I was sure to include her. And then I have friends, Dr. Brooke and Dan Dishman. They're also in the book. But to speak specifically to the character of Dr. Reed. 
In 2014, I was given the opportunity to attend Harvard University. And what this would mean is I would have to leave my family and my dental practice in order to embark upon this opportunity. And I would never forget the day of my interview. It was an extensive day, a whole day. Like it felt like eight hours of different interviews with different people. And I remember sitting in Dr. Reed's office for my interview to try and get into this fellowship program. And I was in awe with this lady, Zinzi. She was the most accomplished African-American woman I have ever physically encountered. You read about people, especially historical figures who've done all this great work. But when I tell you I met her and she was such a humble soul and her servant's heart was just, just trans, like just visible <laughs> out of her physical being. And I came home and I wow. told my husband, I'm going to be the Joan Reed of the South. I'm going to change lives because that's what she does but she never make mention of it and i don't think there's a way she can even, can even quantify the impact she's had on the world from all the people she's poured into and in the book when i got accepted into the harvard program part of the requirement was having one-to-ones with dr reed and those were the most meaningful conversations she did exactly that the character and the role that she plays in the book, that is what she physically did to me and my colleagues. When we had questions about things, she would present a solution in such a simplified manner. But at the same time, she reminded us that we were more than capable, that we were more than able, and that there really were no limits to what we could do. We just had to decide to do it. And then understand that we may not always get it right, but that's okay. Just make the revisions as you go along. So that's who Dr. Reed is. She is a rock star. Mm -hmm. But when I tell you she has a humble servant's heart, that's who she is. And you, you brought that to life with her character in the book because every question that, a, a ch and not really a question, every doubt that each child presented to her as a question, she just kind of crushed it up like a piece of paper and threw it to the side and let them know that they really could achieve this. And I, I listened or I read everything that she, she said, and I, I truly felt convinced. I felt affirmed. And I think as a child reading that book, that comes across quite clearly, regardless of what the situation may be, regardless of what you think you may not have. Dr. Reed really did pour into those children. So has she read a copy of your book as yet? Yes. Oh, and, and, right. Dr. <laughs> and Dr. Reed, she doesn't get too excited about things. You know, that's just who she is, though. You know, she just takes life and she does the work. That's mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing for her is just to do the work to make the difference. And you don't have to get the accolades or the praise. You know, she she's more of an introvert. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> you know, you tackled something that I think is very real for, for young children, that when they don't see someone who looks like them in a particular role, they question whether or not they can pursue such an endeavor. So I know you have your, your foundation in your home state, in your home okay. city, but someone may not be in Memphis. So I'm a little further away from you. What, but your book is able to touch children and, and families across the globe, wherever they can order or purchase. So what impact do you hope that your book will have on their young readers and also on their parents as their parents try to foster in them that belief in the possibility that they can be the next generation of doctors? I want them to understand that there are no limits. And I often describe this whenever I autograph copies of the book. You are your only limitation. And I love the quote when it says, even the sky is not your limit if man has walked on the moon. I want them to realize that it does not matter where you live. It does not matter who is in your life. It does not matter what resources you have. As long as you have the ability to believe in yourself, there are no limits for you. And I hope the parents, as they are reading that to their children, get the same message. Those are some powerfully inspiring words. Thank you. 
recently on social media, and I think also because we're in that graduation season, you know, April to May, you see all the postings of everyone that has that has graduated from from everything from kindergarten all the way up to medical school. And I've noticed in the last couple of years that there has been a great celebration of doctors of color. So where do you find the largest gaps to be in representation in the medical field? Is it by race or by gender? And as a Black woman, as a doctor, how do you believe we begin to close these gaps? So definitely race would present the biggest gap. Believe it or not, even, and let me specifically speak on dentistry and give you some statistics to this. So in the profession of dentistry, Black women dentists make up 1.4%. That's 1.4% of the dentists. However, women in general encompass approximately 51% of the current dental school classes. So women are now becoming the majority in the field of dentistry. So it's definitely not gender-based, that's the largest gap, but race-based. When you see that African-Americans are approximately 13 to 14% of the population, but overall, if you include both male and female, we're about three to 4% of the dental profession, there's a a huge inequity there or discrepancy, I should say there. And what Mm -hmm. can we do? So many people are doing many things. So at at the university level, you have schools creating diversity inclusion centers and programs and groups. You have um, schools being more intentional about their recruitment efforts. And you also have even doctors taking on more mentorship roles to try to encourage students to go into these professions. There is a lot of work to be done. So many people are working on the the inclusion of other races and backgrounds in these uh, healthcare professions, but it's a challenging thing to take the task, especially when there are competing interests. You know, students recognize that when I go to these professional schools, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna owe a lot of money So the opportunity cost of that is giving up the chance to make money now (laughs) and to make money later, but still be embedded in debt. Do I want that? And so that's Mm -hmm. taking a lot of people away from pursuing healthcare careers. And then you have to realize money can be made many ways. You have real estate, you have stock investing. People are making YouTube videos, becoming YouTube stars, YouTube stars and making all this money. So they see that the, the opportunities are limitless. So they're not as just narrow focused to go into healthcare professions as they were in years past. When we were growing up, it was like, you can be three or four things, teacher, doctor, <laughs> lawyer. Now it's like, no, no, no. I could be this. I could be that. I could be this. I don't even have to live in the yes. US. I could be virtual yeah. somewhere else, you know? So it's a and lot. You can do these things in tandem with, a, with something else. You can, yes. you can be a dentist and a YouTube influencer talking yes. about your, mm-hmm. your dentistry. Exactly. Yes. Because yes. there's a platform for everything. Absolutely. Your statistics, you, while you were talking, I'm thinking, and I, I started from the dentist I had that took care of my teeth when I had baby teeth to the dentist that pulled out my wisdom teeth. And while I had one black doctor, I never had a, one black dentist. I never had a female dentist. Wow. Now, my son, in contrast, his dentist is a black female and she has been taking care of his teeth from baby teeth. And well, we don't have wisdom teeth yet, <laughs> but there, you know, that that's an, that's an important thing because you, you, you're right. We, if the amount of kids that are sitting at a dentist chair, sitting in a doctor's office, if they are not seeing someone who looks like them, wh- where do we go? How do we, how do we not only build a bench for the profession, but really build a bench for our, our people, our culture, and our community. And it's so amazing you say that because part of why I even looked into dentistry is because my experience at the dental office was with an African-American woman dentist, my very first experience at 13 years of age. And then when I got braces, my orthodontist was an African-American woman dentist. Now it oh. could have been because I was a Medicaid recipient and typically, mm-hmm. you know, Medicaid recipients are seen by unfortunately, doctors of color. Now, that's not always the case. So I don't want to umbrella that. But a lot of times, 
we see our own people. And I would not probably have pursued the profession of dentistry had I not had two women dentists treating me before I expressed interest. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. You're listening to Authored by Us. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review so you never miss an episode. Now back to the show with your host, Zenzi Hodge. So, Christina, tell us where we can find your book, You Can Become a Doctor Too. It's currently available on Amazon, uh, also online at Target, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, and the book's website, www.youcanbecomeadoctortoo.com. And you also shared that you self-published. So tell us about why you chose that particular route. And I know that you're new on this journey with this being your first children's book, but what has been the most challenging part from the writing the book, publishing the book, or promoting the book? Um, so I am self-published. And the way I went about the process is I just did a Google search and I ran across a website. It was an illustrator. And not only was he an illustrator, uh, he also helped you to, well, guided you through the publishing process. And his name is Mike Motz. And he made it a seamless process for me um, from everything from putting the book on the platforms to the illustrations to um, even giving marketing tips. It was a, a, it was a great value for the money. It was an investment. <laughs> but it was definitely a, a great investment. Um, some of the challenges that I have faced is when I, before I created the book, I just knew this is gonna be a million dollar idea. It, it's gonna sell a hundred thousand copies. Like <laughs> needless to say, <laughs> those targets have not been achieved, but I'm hopeful. Yet. <laughs> yes, yet. yet. Um, but I am hopeful and it, the journey has been so amazing. I, I'm happy that I went the route, you know, that I have gone and I wouldn't change anything about it. You know, I've heard from authors that, you know, their sales have fallen a little short from mm -hmm. what they dreamed, but I always say yet. It, it's yes. the, the hardest part was, it, the hardest part wasn't writing the book. The hardest part was deciding to take that chance on yourself to publish it, to yes. put it out there. Because mm -hmm. once you put it out there, you can't really pull it back. I mean, you could hide it in your house if you like, but, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to say having stacks of books, you know, in your kitchen won't go over well. Right. So you, you took the first step, you, yes. you went forth, you were brave, you put it out there and the sales are going to come. Yes. So and and don't get me wrong. I mean, I think it's done well. But it's just my so initial, because yes. I was not uh, very familiar with how this mm -hmm. book thing works, right? It's a new industry for me, <laughs> but I'm, I'm still grateful. I'm grateful for all the experience I've gotten. And I know that the young readers who've been able to get your books in their hands or to hear you read your book or just see you share about your book, that this is so beneficial to them and not just beneficial in terms of entertainment, encouraging them to read, but it gives them something that tomorrow after I've read your book, it gives me something that I can really, that I can really grow on. Zinzi, just last evening, a young lady who had a copy of the book came up to me and she's eight years old. And you know what she said to me? Thank you for writing your book for me. Oh. And I know just being an eight-year-old, she was just saying she was appreciative that mm -hmm. she was talking to me and I had written a book. But when she said for me, those words just resonated with me. It really touched my heart. I love when kids are so moved by a book that they are able to, and when they're able to connect with that author. Yeah. And that's, that's the importance of being an independent author because you are, you're right there with your audience. You're, you're yeah. really accessible. And so you really get to see the impact and the smile that you put on that little girl's face. Yes. So now that you have book number one under your belt, what's next? Well, book number two is in the works and it's called Our Black People Aliens. I still want to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're all familiar with the happenings in May of last year around Memorial Day with George Floyd. And the event, just as I can imagine for all of us, 
you know, really took away pieces of our heart. Like it really pulled at our heartstrings. And in true Christina Rosenthal fashion, I'm always thinking about our babies. And so many times they, like us, are dealing with real life issues. They're dealing with racism. They're dealing with prejudice. And because they aren't adults, they may not have a, a way of processing the information that they're seeing. And so when I saw this happen, it made me think, do they think we're animals? Do they think we're aliens? I, I just cannot understand how another human can mistreat another human in such a way that's just so vile and so just, I, I can't even think of the word at this moment. So the book came to mind. I, w I thought about those little black children that needed to know, no, you're not an alien. No, there is nothing wrong with you. And then I also thought about those babies who may not be African-American, but want to have a conversation with their parents, but they may be afraid because of things that they're hearing at the dinner table. Yes. And I wanted them to say, I may not have an African-American friend, but wow, they are just like me. And, and, and I can't wait until the book is released because I know the title can be a little uh, eye popping, but in the book, there really is a unifying message of regardless of how you look on the inside, we all have the same desires. We all have the same interests. We like to dance. We like to go to school, you know, so all of these things. And so I can't wait until it's, it's put out there. And I also can't wait to hear the responses that I get from it. So when will this new book be ready? I am hoping by the end of May. Oh, this May? Like yes. this month? Oh, yes, like this it. month, this new month. <laughs> so you will definitely have to keep us posted. Because I, will. I, I cannot wait to read that one. Yes. Now, because you're a children's author, uh, you write books for other people's children. And as you shared, you met a young girl who said that your book was just for her. So it definitely had an impact on her. But what book had the most impact on Christina when she was growing up? Oh, when I was growing up, I can't tell you it was one particular book, but I can tell you it was a collection of books. And those books were encyclopedias. And because your audience may be diverse in age, I would like to define what an encyclopedia is. <laughs> it's just a collection of random information where you can learn anything. It's like Google in print form. And as I mentioned earlier, Zinzi, I grew up in the inner city and uh, resources were limited, very, very limited. But in encyclopedias, I could escape. I could go to China. I could learn about the people, the culture, the food. I could learn about careers. In fact, I would often say I was going to be a cardiologist because in an encyclopedia, I read that they made $350,000 in a year. <laughs> now, I've since learned better that you don't choose a career based on money alone. That's not really wise. So I'm happy I went into dentistry. But encyclopedias opened me up to a whole new world that I did not know existed. And so encyclopedias were definitely my most cherished books as a kid. I love that because no one has ever said encyclopedias. <laughs> and we still have two sets of encyclopedias at my mother's house. My son is in the eighth grade. And I think when he was in the sixth grade, he did a paper. Uh, he did a research paper. And I told him, I said, go over there, go grab that encyclopedia. So here he was writing a paper with a citation from a 1978 World Book wow. Encyclopedia. I love <laughs> I it, it was so. hilarious. Yes, I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Christina, thank you so much for spending the time here with us on today's episode. It was truly a pleasure talking with you, hearing about your book, You Can Become a Doctor Too. And just hearing about your experiences, because you're not just an author, you're not just a dentist, but you have created something in your foundation that is designed to build your community, build the next generation, and really have an impact on our world. So thank you for being with us, and thank you for sharing all that you've done. Thank you for having me. So as we close the cover on this bookshelf gem, I would love to thank our author, Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal, for sharing her book, You Can Become a Doctor Too. I'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us on this week's episode of Authored by Us. 
Thank you for joining us this week. And we invite you to come back next week as we speak with a new author sharing their book. Until next time, happy reading. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Authored by Us. Every author has a story to tell, and we enjoy bringing their stories to you each week. Whether you are listening as a young reader or are sharing this podcast with the young readers in your life, we are delighted to celebrate these stories inspired by diversity and shared in the voice of their authors. Follow us on social media at Authored by Us and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss an episode. Have a gem on your bookshelf that we should have on ours? Visit us online at authoredbyus.com and let us know. Until next time, happy reading.